Sabbath, everyone. It's always a blessing to be with you. And uh, we have some wonderful things to study with you this morning. I know Roy pray, but let's just bow our heads where we are. Father, please, we pray for your spirit, Father. May he teach us and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. So my intention is to share with you, uh, next time I'm here, and initially today, is some principles in regards to health. And then as I prayed, the Lord convicted me, rather than uh, just talk about health specifically, I think it would be better to give some background as to how this health message came about. So inspiration talks about the health message being misused and mishandled. So I think if we give some historical background as to the importance of how it rose and what it's about and what is the purpose of it, uh, when we share the practical principles that you can use in your own life and then uh, share with others, you have better meaning as to what the health message is all about. So we're just going to go through the history of how our health message came about and when I return on July 5th, uh, we'll spend that entire day talking about some practical things in light of the health message. So let's get into this morning's presentation. Our health message. In 1863, we're having some technical difficulties. In 1863, the General Conference was organized. That was May 21st, 1863. That's the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then notice that 16 days later, just two weeks later, the first major health reform vision was given June 6th. Now, I ask a question. Do you think that that's a coincidence? As soon as the church was organized, two weeks later, as soon as our messages were established and we had a sense of direction, as soon as we were organized, you see this two weeks later, Ellen White had our first major vision in light of health reform. So you see that immediately God wanted to combine these two things. Are you with me so far? Now, in autumn of 1848, this was when the first known vision dealing with health reform uh, related matters. Very small scale. Then in 1854, a second limited vision was given. And then, of course, as we noted, in 1863, we had the first major comprehensive health vision given at Otsego, uh, Michigan, in the home of Aaron Hillard during a family worship period. Now, just to give a background as to what took place at that time, uh, at this point, uh, our pioneers were still eating pork, still partaking of a lot of unhealthful things. And uh, they would normally pray, and then health healing would come. This particular instance, James White has been worn, um, and they thought that he was going to die. And they gathered together, and they began to pray earnestly for James White at this prayer meeting at Brother Hillard's, and instead of God miraculously healing James White as they thought, God answered in a different way. He took Ellen White off in vision, and for 45 minutes, he began to reveal for her the wonderful health message that we now have and combined it with the organization of the church. Now, on Christmas Day, 1865, the second major health vision was given in Rochester, New York. And in this vision particularly, God began to reveal to her that we need to set up institutions for healing where the, the, the sick, uh, sin, sick sinners can come and leave healthy saints. Which helps me to share the first objective. The objective of the medical missionary work is not to take sick sinners and make them healthy sinners. It is to take sick sinners and make them healthy what? Healthy saints. So that is the objective of the medical missionary work. Now, this was the first sanitarium in Battle Creek. And notice that this was 1865, that she received that vision, December 1865, as you see at the bottom, Christmas Day. And then less than a year later, in the September 1866, in, in response to the vision, she, she, uh, they began to build the first sanitarium. The first sanitarium. As you can see, very small, very humble, just a simple home that was renovated. Uh, they added some treatment rooms to the house and did some, uh, some minor renovations. And this was our first sanitarium, the first sanitarium. It was called the Western Health Reform Institute. And again, this was September 5th. 1866. We're talking about the story of our health message. Is everyone with me so far? 
You go on. Now, notice that the first sanitarium was in 1866. In 1907, how many years later is that? From 1866 to 1907. Oh, come on, saints. We need to go back to elementary school now. <laughs> 41 years later. So notice, this is 41 years later, right? Listen to this statement. Ellen White says, the medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. Then notice, she said, the meaning of genuine medical missionary work is known but by few. Now notice, 41 years later, after the, we have our first sanitarium, and there's a lot of things that transpired, she said the medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. Now, if you see a 41-year-old that's still acting as an infant, what would you think of that person? You said that there's some arrested development, would you, would you not? So we see that even though the medical missionary work is now 41 years, uh, in fact, it's actually uh, 44 years after the first vision, the first major vision, but yet she said it's an infant. Now let me give some clarification. When that first sanitarium was established, the one that I just saw, that humble, small uh, sanitarium, it was doing a mighty and wonderful work. It was carrying out the plan that God had desired for it. So what we need to do now is fill in a gap. What happened between 1866 and 1907? There had to be some things that transpired in between this time where now Ellen White can say that the medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. Now, quest, now, she asked the question, then she asked the question, why? The medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. The meaning of genuine medical missionary work is known but by few. Then she asked the question, why? Then she proceeds to answer the question. Notice, she said, because the Savior's plan of work has not been followed. Again, this is 1907. The Savior's plan of work has not been followed. So you can make some connections. What connection would you automatically make from this? That what was taking place between 1866 and 1907, something along, somewhere along the line, the Savior's plan dwindled down and is no longer followed. So what question would you actually ask? What was the Savior's plan? Very good question. I put it up there. What is the Savior's plan? Because the reason why it's still in its infancy is because what? Because the plan hasn't been followed. So if we're going to follow the plan, what's the first thing we need to know? What is the plan? So do you, are you, do you want to know what the plan is? Let's study what the plan is. Let's go in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and starting at verse 18. We're going to look at what was the Savior's plan that was not being followed, why the medical missionary work 41 years later was called an infant. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 18. When you dare say amen. amen. Put it on the screen. Matthew 4, verse 18. And the Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. Now notice, in verse 19, the Bible says, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you what? fishers of men. So whatever Jesus does after this, because Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So whatever he does after he says this is the Savior's plan. Because they were doing one thing and Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to change your careers to make you fishers of men if you follow me. So we're going to follow Christ to see what he does. Amen? Drop down to verse 23. <clears throat> verse 23. The Bible says in verse 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, what's the first thing? Teaching in their synagogue, what's the second thing? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom, what's the third? And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. What are three things we saw him doing? Talk to me, saints. Teaching, preaching, and healing. What does the next verse say? The next verse says, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people, and who else? Divers diseases, tormentors, and those who were possessed with devils, and those who which were lunatic, etc., etc. So you notice the Bible also says that his fame went throughout all Syria. 
How did his fame get there? You don't want to know how? The people published the glad tidings by word of mouth of the Savior. So we see that his plan was teaching, preaching, healing, and also publishing. We're not going to have time to go through the scriptures to show publishing, but just keep that in mind. Now I want you to follow systematically. Now, when you read the Bible, just keep in mind that the Bible was not originally written in chapters and verses. We're blessed to have that. Amen? But Matthew chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 5 is not necessarily a change of thought. It was just one continual flowing text. So just watch how it transitions over to chapter 5. We're going to continue reading. Verse 25 says, After he was teaching, preaching, healing, and publishing, and verse uh, 24 particularly, we saw that they brought unto him all that were sick and all that were taken in diverse diseases, etc., etc., lunatics, and he healed them. Now notice what happened directly after he healed them, directly after. It wasn't two weeks later. It wasn't a year later. It wasn't a few days later. Immediately he transitions into Matthew chapter 5. I want, want you to notice. Verse 25 says, And there followed him what? Great multitudes of people from Galilee and from the capitalists and from Jerusalem and from Judea and, and beyond Jordan. Now notice what happens in verse five, uh, chapter 5. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and did what? Taught them, saying. So immediately after Jesus used the health message to draw the people, he didn't wait a few months later. He didn't wait a few weeks later. He didn't wait a few hours later. You see that he combined the work of healing and teaching. You guys see that? So when it says the Savior's plan was not followed, what was taking place that there was a disconnection between the work of healing and preaching, the work of healing and teaching. Now let's get some references. We looked at these. Let's skip through these. Now, uh, just for reference sake, we don't have time to go through it. When you go to Matthew chapter 9, what we read in Matthew chapter 4 was the first Galilean tour. In Matthew chapter 9, when he go, went through his second Galilean tour, you see he did the same exact thing. Matthew 9 verse 35 says he was preaching, teaching, healing, and also we know that he was publishing. So the method does not change. Just keep that in mind. In Matthew chapter 10, when he sent the disciples out, he said, heal the sick and also preach saying. So we saw that the work of healing and preach was also combined when he sent the disciples out. Now, our example. Notice what it says here in the book, Ministry of Healing, page 140. It says the work of the gospel, in the work of the gospel, teaching and healing are, what's this word, saints? Never to be separated. How often is never? Never. Put a number on it. Zero. So how often are we supposed to separate the work of healing and preaching? It should never happen. Now notice what it says here. Uh, we're going to show some more profound statements. It said the Divine Commission needs no reform. Christ's way of presenting truth cannot be improved upon. So obviously between those years of 1866 and 1907, someone tried to do something to improve upon the plan of Christ. And as a result of trying to improve upon something that was perfect, they spoiled it. And as a result of spoiling it, Inspiration said the medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. The work of genuine medical missionary work is known yet by few. Why? Because the Savior's plan has not been followed. It goes on. It says, Christ's way of presenting truth cannot be improved upon. The worker who tries to bring in methods that will attract the what? The worldly-minded. Have you seen that? We begin to, well, let me, let, let, me let, let it speak for itself. It says, supposing that this will remove the objections that they feel to taking up the cross lessens his influence, preserve the simplicity of godliness. We've come up with this idea, and I don't know how this makes us different from the Muslims and the Rastafarians and the uh, atheists and agnostics and the New Agers, that we can just share the principles of health and separate it from the message. That's not our calling, brothers and sisters. And I'm going to drive that home very forcefully this morning. The work of healing and preaching are never to be separated. They go hand in hand. And the Bible says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Now listen to this reference. It says here, the Holy Spirit never has and never will in the future divorce the medical missionary work from the gospel ministry. They cannot be divorced bound up with Jesus Christ, 
the ministry of the word and the healing of the sick are what? Are one. So we see that these are one. And again, the Bible says what God has joined together, let no man do what? Put asunder. Look at the next reference. Now, this is Battle Creek. Uh, we shared this before. And in Battle Creek, this was the humble sanitarium that was established in West, called the Western Health Reform Institute. And this was in September 5th, 1866. Now, I want you to listen to these words of inspiration. Now, let me just say off the bat, brothers and sisters, it is very dangerous when we disregard the counsel of inspiration. When you look at all the pioneers that fell in apostasy and left the church and the grieved the spirit, they all point back to the same source. They received counsel after counsel after counsel in light of the spirit of prophecy, and they rejected it. Wagner, Jones, Sheaf, uh, Hull, you name all these pioneers that decided to apostatize, building. They received counsel after counsel, and they rejected it. It's dangerous when we read anything in the counsel of the spirit of prophecy and choose not to follow it. We have history to prove that. Now, listen to the counsel that was given. It says, I have been repeatedly shown that it is not wise to erect, what? Mammoth institutions. What does it mean by mammoth? Large, gigantic, huge. I have been repeatedly shown that it is not the wise to erect mammoth institutions. It is not by the largeness of an institution that the greatest work for souls is to be accomplished. A mammoth sanitarium requires many workers and where so many are brought together, it is exceedingly difficult to do what? Maintain a high standard of spirituality. Now keep in mind, she's talking about a health institute. Now, what were the references that we shared before and what we read in the Bible? What were they saying? That teaching and healing should never be what? Separated. Separated. So she's warning that if these mammoth institutions are established, naturally you need hundreds or thousands of workers, right? And it is difficult to find a, a few hundred workers that believe the same thing. So therefore, the spirituality of the ministry or the institution will suffer. So she said, rather than in making these mammoth institutions, whereas you have to bring in worldly-minded uh, 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 workers, it is better to keep it large, I mean small, so that the spirituality can be maintained. Now notice. And where so many are brought together, it is exceedingly difficult to maintain a high standard of spirituality in a large institution. It often happens that responsible places are filled by workers who are not what? Spiritually minded. Now, you're, you're, you're beginning to see the gap of what happened between 1866 and 1907. Are you seeing it? It says, who do not exercise wisdom in dealing with those who, if wisely treated, would be awakened, convicted, and converted. Now, question. Was this council followed? Was this council followed? Now, let me see the hands of those that say yes, it was followed. Let me see the hands of those that say no, it was not followed. Now, the majority of you didn't, didn't put your hand up. It's all right. Now, it says here, no mammoth institutions, high standard of spirituality, etc., etc. Now, Remember, this humble little sanitarium was established in 1866, and it did a mighty work. I want you to notice what happened in 1878. 1878. Let's move forward. Question was asked, was this council followed? Let's, let's, let's look. That is our next sanitarium that was built in 1878. Now, what was the council that was given? The sanitarium should be what? Should be small. It said that there should be no gigantic or mammoth institutions. So in 1878, through the influences of Dr. Kellogg, two years after he came in and began to run the institution in 1876. In 1878, he tore down that small, humble, uh, powerful sanitarium, and this was built. It's dangerous. Remember I said it's dangerous, brothers and sisters, when we do not heed the counsels of the spirit of prophecy. Now this looks pretty large, but this is only a side angle. Let me give you a full aerial view of the sanitarium. That we were, remember, we were, had the explicit counsel. 
that we should not make mammoth sanitariums. Are you ready to see the next picture? You sure? <laughs> Come on. Are we having some technical difficulties? This is the aerial view of the sanitarium that we are told that we should not make gigantic and mammoth institutions. Now this is the main building, you can see. And from where you are, what you're looking at is just the roof of three attached buildings to the main building. Now remember, we're told not to make what? We're told not to make what? Mammoth institution. Now, if you notice, uh, if you just look down, you can see all these windows. It's, it's kind of hard to see. But this alone is a gigantic building. This alone is a gigantic building. And this also is a gigantic building. This is the gymnasium. Uh, this is the, one of these two are the male and female dormitories. So a question, I'm going to ask a question again. Was the council heated that we should not make mammoth institutions? No. So you see that already uh, the gap between 1866 and 1907 is beginning to be filled. Do you see that so far? So we're going to find out what took place between these time, year, the time periods. Now, you can see here, this is outside of Battle Creek. And we are told that we should have small, family-oriented medical missionary institutions, small sanitariums. Can you see how much people this is? This is hundreds, if not thousands of people. You, you can see the line goes all the way back. Now, at one point, well, we read it, but they had over 350 nurses working at the sanitarium. They were taking hundreds, if not thousands, of health guests at a time. And we're told that the sanitarium should not be what? Mammoth or large. Now, they already see that they're breaking the counsel of the spirit of prophecy. Let's move on. I see my time is getting away. <clears throat> now, as a result of the council being broken, in 1902, there was a fire, and that sanitarium, that beautiful, spectacular, magnificent sanitarium that you just saw was burned down. <clears throat> Again, I say it is very dangerous, very dangerous when we don't follow the counsel of the spirit of prophecy. So that counts that sanitarium burned down in 1902. Then uh, Dr. Kellogg uh, wrote this letter, this article. Let me try to blow it up a little bit. It says here, the Battle Creek Sanitarium burned to the ground Tuesday, February 18, 1902. Of the 400 guests, how many? Does that sound small? Of the 400 guests occupying the building, everyone was rescued. One elderly gentleman became confused and wandered back in the building and was lost. The only fatality, aside from one fractured limb, etc., etc., etc. Then it says, notice, the great saving of life was due to the fact that, now notice, that convenient fire escapes were accessible from every room, and the 350 nurses were well drilled in their duties, the volume up in such an emergency and response, responded bravely to the demand of the occasion. Now, question. Now think about it. There was a couple of, over, maybe over a thousand people, you know, a couple of hundred guests, a couple of hundred nurses and different workers, and only one person died because they went back into the building. Do you think that that's the work of a man? Or do you think that God has something to do with that? Now in his dissertation on this, uh, on this letter, did he give God any glory? What did he say? Our nurses were well-trained. That means he well-trained them. They were well-disciplined. We had fire drills and then you, where all the fire escapes were. So you see off the bat that he took all the glory for himself. It's dangerous. Now, let's, let's, look at, let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12. Let's see how dangerous it is when you give yourself the glory. Acts chapter 12. And let's notice what the Bible says, beginning at verse 21. Acts 12, verse 21. It is dangerous when we take the glory that only God deserves. The Bible says in Acts chapter 12, beginning at 21, it says, And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal peril, sat upon the throne, and made an oration unto them oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, what did they say? 
It is the voice of God and not of man. So uh, Herod was being called a God. Now notice what happens in verse 23. And the Bible says, and what? Immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. You think the same thing happened in Babylon. Is not the grist the great Babylon that I have built? You remember that? The Bible says immediately the kingdom was taken from him. We have to always give God the glory. So as a result of this mammoth institution, this gigantic, you know what? Kellogg began to say, is not this a great institution that I have built? If he had only followed the counsel, keep it humble and homely and family oriented, God could have used him to do a mighty work. But as a result of his pride and his pomp, we see that Herod, uh, he, he became like Herod and began to be cut off. Now I want you to notice, what it, bring your attention to the bottom here. It says, now notice, remember, we're, they were giving counsel that what kind of institutions are not to be built? Mammoth institution. Notice what he says here. In the meantime, the erection of a new fireproof building will be pushed as rapidly as possible. We hope it will be completed early in July. The new building will uh, consist of brick, iron, and concrete, solid floors, partitions, and models in every particular. So not only did he rebuild the building, but this one had marble floors and uh, golden uh, decors and different statues and even of a greater magnitude. So not only did, did he reject the counsel of the spirit of prophecy, not only did he see the hand, he, he didn't see that it was the hand of God that allowed that building to be burned down to give them the opportunity to follow counsel, but he was determined that he's going to even go a step further than where he was before. Now remember, we said it's dangerous when you don't follow the counsel of the spirit of prophecy and give God the glory. Amen? Now let's go on to see what takes place. This is the fire that we saw burning the building. These are actual pictures in 1902. And then, question, did Dr. Kellogg get the point? What do you say? No, he didn't get it. Then he, this was rebuilt. Now, if you go to Battle Creek, I think uh, those that have gone there recently, I think you might see this. This building was actually bought over. We're going we're gonna to look at that. But he rebuilt this. Not only did he build this, but then he began to even build a Babylonian tower. You see that? He began to bring even a, a tower of Babel. So did Dr. Kellogg get the point? No. We're talking about the story of our health message. Let's move on. 1903, less than a year later, this mammoth institution, even more mammoth institution, was rebuilt. This was just an annex building that was attached to the main building. So we see that there were even gigantic buildings that were attached that was not necessarily uh, directly attached to the buildings. Having a technical issue here. All right, so in the meantime, in 1903, one, this mammoth institution was rebuilt. He began to build, uh, write this book called The Living Temple. Has anyone heard of this book? Living Temple? Now, this book was dangerous in that it said that there's a God in everything. God is in everything and God is everywhere. Uh, now, what's so dangerous about that? It does something particularly. There's many things, but there's one thing I'm looking for particularly. Anyone knows what was, the, what was so dangerous about this book? That's right. Did you hear that? It says it negates the investigative judgment. Now, if God is everywhere and God is in everything, then did he really move from the holy to the most holy place in 1844? And then, then did an investigative judgment really start in 1844 if God is everywhere? Do you get the point? So we see that uh, stealthily, the devil began to negate through Dr. Kellogg the message of 1844, the investigative judgment, the three angels' messages. A sanctuary message. So this book began to negate the foundation of our faith. It was a direct attack on the foundation of our faith. This is in 1903. Notice this words from inspiration. In the book, Select the Message, book 1, page 200, it says, In the book, Living Temple, there is presented the what? The alpha of deadly heresies. The omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. So we see that the alpha apostasy began with a few things. One, 
It began with the disregard of the Council of the Spirit of Prophecy. Two, it began with this book, Living Temple, that was a direct attack on the foundational pillars of our faith. And then three, it also had its foundation in separating the work of the gospel and the medical missionary work. Do you see that? We go on. Then, inspiration again, I'm saying it, brothers and sisters, it is dangerous not to follow the counsel of the spirit of prophecy. Review and Herald decided that they were going to print the book Alpha, uh, The Living Temple. Even though inspiration gave explicit instructions that this was the Alpha, she gave explicit instruction that this book should not, in fact, she said one was sent to her and she didn't even read it. She said she just put it aside. She herself didn't even read it. She said that this book was dangerous and she gave warning to our leaders. And then Review and Herald decided that they're going to go against the Council of the Spirit of Prophecy. And they said, you know what, we're going to print the book anyway. So the day before, they had the plate set up, the printing plate set up, and everything was set so that the next day that they'll come and begin printing. So everything was set that night. And you know what happened that very night? A mysterious fire came and burned down the Review and Herald, and every single plate that was set to print this book was burned up. Not only that, they said that when the firemen came and they were trying to put the fire, that water was like fuel. Do you get that? So the water that was supposed to be putting out the fire was actually in, initiating more fire, and it was just flames that's burning to all, every single printing plate that was set up was burned up. And then Review and Herald, fortunately, they got it. They received the message. They moved as they were counted to. But Dr. Kellogg, he, he got an independent print and still printed the book. And it was still supported by the conference. And it was also pushed heavily by uh, A.T. Jones and, and others, uh, pioneers. And then we saw the fall of A.T. Jones as a result of disregarding this council as well. And unfortunately, both A.T. Jones and Dr. Kellogg died outside of the faith, not heeding the council of the spirit of prophecy. So Review and Herald burned down because they disregarded the council to not print the book. Now notice these words of inspiration. It said, the Lord permitted fire to consume the principal buildings of Review and Herald and the sanitarium and thus remove the greatest objection urged against moving out of Battle Creek. It was his design that instead of rebuilding the one large sanitarium, our people should make what? Plants in several places. These smaller sanitariums should be, have been established where land could be secured for agricultural purposes. It is God's plan that agriculture should be connected with the work of the sanitariums and schools. Our youth need to be educated to be gained from this line of work. It is well and well, it is essential that efforts be made to carry out the Lord's plan in this respect. So she made it very plain that it was God's providences that Review and Herald, as well as portions of the sanitarium, were burned down. Now, just to give a historical chronology, this is actually on Wikipedia. This is about Kellogg and the sanitarium. It says the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan, United States, was a health resort based on the health principles advocated by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, most notably associated with John Harvey Kellogg. The complex was purchased by the U.S. Army during the World War II and converted into the Percy Jones Army Hospital. The facility later became the Hart Dole Federal Center. As Kellogg put it, they took the word sanatorium, which back then was defined as an English term designated a health resort for invalid soldiers. A change of two letters transformed sanatorium to sanitarium, and a new word was added to the English language. Now, I think we missed a slide. Let me go back one. Brother David, if you could just control it for me if it's not working. Just go back one slide for me, please. Not working? All right. You can stop there. It says the, it first opened in September 5th, 1866, as the Western Health Reform Institute. This is on Wikipedia. It says in 1876, John Harvey Kellogg became the superintendent, and his brother, uh, K. Kellogg, worked as the bookkeeper. In 1878, a new structure was built on the site, but it was burned down in 1902. The following year, it was rebuilt, enlarged, and renamed the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Now, we read the, the beginning portion. Now, I'm going to call your attention to the bottom. It said, Kellogg stated 
the number of patients grew from 106 in 1866 to 7,006 patrons during the year when? 1906. Now, remember, I said to keep those dates in mind. So we saw 7,000 from 100. So in, when they opened in, in 1866, 106. And then they grew in 1906 to 7,006. Now, remember the statement that we shared. I'm going to put it back on the screen. Medical missionary work is yet in its what? Then it says, the meaning of genuine medical missionary work is known but by how? Then she answers the question, why? She asks the question, why? And then it goes on to say, because the Savior's plan has not yet been followed. And this was 1907. Now, just, I just want you to back up and, and, and keep this in mind. In 1906, how many health guests did they see in 1906? 7,006. Keep that in mind. How long after the first vision was this? Or after the first institution? 41 years. You guys remember that? So 41 years later, in one year they now saw 7,006 health guests, and she said the medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. The meaning of genuine medical missionary work is yet known by but few. Why? Because the Savior's plan has not yet been followed. You see, systematically and strategically, the devil had instilled in the mind of Dr. Kellogg that we need to have these large institutions, and it lost its spirituality. He began to bring in worldly workers and worldly nurses, and it lost its spirituality. We saw that the medical missionary work and the, health, uh, and, and the work of the gospel, the third angel's message, was separated. And as a result, even though people were coming there and being healed, even though it had worldwide accolades, even though persons of prestige and presidents and these other persons were coming there and leaving healed, she said the medical missionary work is yet in its infancy. And the work of genuine medical missionary work is known but by few. We're not called to follow the same methods that the world follows. If we separate the message, the third angel, from the medical missionary work, we're just like the New Agers, just like the Muslims, just like the Rastafarians. In fact, when Ellen White first got the vision, there was another institution that were following a lot of these principles. The guy was called J.C. Jackson. He was a physician. I believe it was in the Rochester area, Rochester, New York. And Ellen White went to J.C. Jackson. James White was sick, and she went there to spend a few weeks to try to get healing. And she said, because there was no praying, and they said that they were too religious. They did too much praying, and they believed that religiosity was messing with their minds, and that was the purpose, probably the reason why they weren't being healed. You know what they did? Even though they were following the seven laws of health, they were saying, you know what, you need to get air, you need to get water, you need to get sunlight, you need to make sure you're vegetarian, have proper nutrition. This was in 1863 or 1865. They were following the, this institution, was following these principles. You know what Ellen White and James White did? They withdrew themselves from that institution. Why? Because they didn't understand that there was a spiritual connection to the medical missionary work. So she saw that even though they were following these seven beautiful and wonderful principles, because that one element, that most vital element of godly trust was missing, they said, we cannot stay here because my husband will never be healed if he stays here. And then we saw that just a few months later, Inspiration got a vision in uh, December 1865, and then from this vision, we established our first sanitarium, and then when this, pro this plan was strategically followed, we saw that healing was taking place. Healing was taking place according to God's plan. But then Kellogg began to separate it, made this mammoth institution. Now, I want you to notice these words of inspiration. It says, if a sanitarium connected with the closing message fails to lift up Christ, and the principles of the gospel as developed in the third angel's message, it fails in its most important feature and contradicts the very object of its existence. So the purpose of the medical missionary work is to lift up Christ. And we're going to drive that home forcefully. Are you with me so far? It is to promulgate the gospel of the third angel's message. And who's the gospel? I am not ashamed of the gospel of? Of Jesus Christ. So the medical missionary work is centered in Christ. Christ was the first true, genuine medical missionary. 
And if we're not pointing uh, sin sick sinners to the Savior, then we're not doing medical missionary work. We're doing humanitarian work. And as a result, Kellogg began to separate the gospel from the medical missionary work, and he began to do a humanitarian work, and Ellen White wrote to him and said, you know what? She said, the Salvation Army does a wonderful work, and we're not to prevent them, but that's not our work. Our work is to lift up the third angel's message, which centered in, in Christ, and true healing only come when Christ is uplifted. Are you with me, saints? Amen. So never have this idea that we can do the health first and then a couple of months or a couple of weeks or a couple of years later, we break down the barriers and all of a sudden we introduce Christ. No. Never works. In fact, uh, our medical missionaries that meet ministry will just graduate and I'll, I'll close the message for them. I'll share with them. Imagine Lazarus. You remember Lazarus? Lazarus was dead, right? The Bible talks about two dead. In, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 6, he says, Let the dead bury their dead. That tells us that there's a spiritual dead and a, and a physical dead. Now, can you imagine before Jesus came that Mary and Martha began to talk to Lazarus and say, Lazarus, you know what? You need to get more exercise. He's in a tomb. Lazarus, you need to get more exercise. Lazarus, you need to get more water. Lazarus, you need to take an hour walk a day. Lazarus, you shouldn't eat uh, fruits and vegetables together. Lazarus, this, that, and other. How much effect would that have? You have none. Why? Because they're speaking to the dead. Many of us, we go and we speak into the spiritual dead and expect something to happen without Christ. When Christ came, it made a difference, didn't it? When Christ came, Lazarus was resurrected from the dead, and then Christ could say, Lazarus, you need to follow these counsels. When we go and we bring the medical missionary work without Christ, without bringing Christ first, last, and center, then we're preaching to the dead, and it will never get into those cells. Are you with me, saints? So the medical missionary work is not a separation of the gospel. It is, it, Christ must be first, last, center, middle. Every aspect of the work must center in Christ. Are you with me, saints? Now notice, what is the purpose of our sanitariums? What is the purpose of our sanitariums? It says God's what? Purpose in giving a third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to do what? Stand true to him during the investigative judgment. This is the purpose in which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, and what's this? Our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treat rooms, and food factories. This is our purpose in carrying forward how many? Every line of work in the cause. The purpose of our sanitariums is not to take a sin sick sinner and make him a healthy saint or a healthy sinner. The purpose of our sanitariums is to take a sin sick sinner and make him a healthy saint. Not just a healthy saint to, to come to church and to carry out the business as usual. It is to prepare them to stand true to God during the investigative judgment. Our sanitarium should be teaching that people must have victory over sin in their daily lives. That's the purpose of our sanitariums. United work. Notice. It says here, my brethren, the Lord calls for unity, for oneness. We are to be one in faith. I want to tell you that when the gospel ministers and the medical missionary work are not united, notice what happens. There is placed on our churches the worst evil that can be placed there. The worst evil. I'm going to skip through for the sake of time. In fact, let me read it. Our medical missionaries ought to be interested in the work of our conferences. Our conference workers ought to be as much interested in the work of our medical missionaries. That's medical missionary uh, medical Ministry 241. We try to wrap up. Warning. This is a warning that was given by inspiration. The health reform is a branch of the special work God for, has for his people, to benefit for his people. I saw that in an institution established among us, what does it say? The greatest danger would be of its managers departing from the spirit of what? of the present truth and from the simplicity which should ever characterize the discipline of disciples of Christ. A warning was given me against lowering the standard of truth in any way in such an institution in order to help the feelings of unbelievers and thus secure their patronage. Now notice what it goes on to say. It says, the great object of receiving unbelievers into the institutions is to lead them to embrace the truth. If the standard is lowered, 
they will get the impression that the truth is of little importance and they will go away in a state of mind harder of access than before. The work of the medical missionary and the work of that of the gospel shall never be separated, brothers and sisters, never be separated. Let me skip forward to wrap up. He says, I see so many doing what? Claiming to be medical missionaries. You know, Ted Wilson is doing a wonderful thing. Um, as soon as he came into office, he began to push for medical missionary training in different institutions. And I was in New York and saw many persons that were so-called trained as medical missionaries. And you see medical missionaries walking around in tank tops, so-called medical missionaries, walking around in mini skirts, and they use the title that I'm a medical missionary. Brothers and sisters, not because you go through a medical missionary training makes you a medical missionary. In fact, let's notice what the Bible says. Let's go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. When we use the terminology medical missionary, that's the title of Jesus Christ. And we don't want to use Jesus' name in vain. Amen? It says here, And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, Now notice what they are saying. We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let me be called by thy name to take away our reproach. So we see that they don't want to make the sacrifices. They don't want to change their appetite. They don't want to change what they wear. They don't want to change their minds. They don't want to change their form of entertainment. But they want to take on the name of Christ and say, you know what? I'm a medical missionary. No, saints. It says, the representation of what Christ was on this earth was flashes before me. As I think of how far short the workers today fall when compared with the divine example, my heart is bowed down with a sorrow that words cannot express. Then the question is asked, will men and women ever do a work that bears the features and the character of the great medical missionary? That's a question that we ask ourselves. So as I mentioned this morning, originally I was going to talk about none of these diseases. I was going to begin to talk about some of the principles of the medical missionary work and what we need to do. But it's dangerous to put the, hand, the tools into the hand of someone that doesn't know how to use it. So rather than just begin to give you medical missionary training and principles, we need to know first and foremost what is the purpose and what is the objective of a medical missionary. Do you get a picture of what it is, brothers and sisters? This statement rings in my ears for many years since I first came across it. Notice what it says here. Let's read this together. It says the work, let's read it together. The work of the true medical missionary is what? Is largely a what? One more time. The work of the true medical missionary is what? Is largely a spiritual work. Our objective is not the same as Dr. Campbell. Our objective is not the same as Dr. Esselstyn. You know, they, they share some wonderful principles with Bill Clinton and praise God, we see the results. He lost weight, he looks great, he doesn't have the heart issues and the cardiovascular issues that he once had. Praise God! But that's not our objective. Dr. Campbell has a good work, but it's not, he's not a medical missionary. Dr. Esselstyn has a good work but he's not a medical missionary. We have two different objectives. Are you with me? Let me share quickly what our objectives are as we begin to close. It says the medical missionary work done in connection with the giving of the what? The third angel's message is to accomplish wonderful results. Now no, notice what it goes on to say. There are three reasons why the th medical missionary work is largely spiritual. One, diseases are 90% of diseases are spiritual. Now notice what it says here. It says, Satan is what? Is the originator of, of disease, and the physician is warring against his work and power. Now keep this in mind. Who's the originator of disease? Now let me ask a question. If Satan inflicts a disease upon a person, how much poultices or how much uh, vegetable juice is going to remove that disease? How many? None. You know what you need to remove that disease? 
the great physician, Jesus Christ. So if Satan is the originator of disease and the physician is warned against his work and power, we know that the only way that we can fight this enemy is by fighting through Christ, and that's why it says the work of a true medical missionary is largely a spiritual work. Let me tell you how the devil works. If he's the one that inflicted you with disease, right? And he sees that a person come and separates Christ, you know what he'll do? He'll remove that disease. He said, well, Christ is not uplifted. Somebody's going to get the glory. And as long as Christ does not get the glory, it doesn't matter to me. But when you begin to put Christ in the midst of this work, the devil is going to bind you with this disease, brothers and sisters, and now it becomes a spiritual warfare, and if you're not calling on a higher power, this disease will never be moved. Let me illustrate. We won't go there for the sake of time. In the book of Daniel chapter 10, Daniel, Gabriel, who's the number one angel in heaven, who replaced Lucifer, was commissioned to go to Daniel. Now Daniel, when Gabriel finally arrived, 21 days later, did you hear that? How long? 21 days later, he said that I was on my way, but I was withstood by the prince of Persia. He was withstood by the devil. Now think about it. Gabriel is the number one angel in heaven. And he was commissioned to go to Daniel. And for 21 days, the devil himself withstood Gabriel and Gabriel couldn't go. Do we fight against the mighty foe? You know what happened? He said... But Michael came. Are you with me, saints? Wow. But Michael came. And as soon as Michael came, immediately, did you catch that? Immediately, Gabriel was able to finish his, accomplish his task. Now keep in mind, Gabriel is the number one heaven in, uh, angel in heaven. And for 21 days, the devil himself withstood him until Michael came. Satan is the originator of disease. And the physician is warned against his work and power. There is no physician that can withstand the power of the enemy until Michael comes. And that's why when we understand that the work of a true medical missionary is largely a spiritual work, at no point in this world's history can we separate these two works because we know that true healing cannot take place until Michael comes because the devil himself is inflicting these diseases. It says, sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. And notice, nine-tenths, 90% of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. We need Jesus in every step, brothers and sisters. Never should these works be separated. Now, I'm going to share the three reasons, and then we close. Who needs help in such diseased minds? Notice, it says, the physician needs more than human wisdom and power that he may know how to minister to the many perplexing cases of disease of the mind and heart with which he is called. Now notice, called the deal. Now notice, if he is ignorant of the power of divine grace, notice, he cannot help the afflicted one, but will aggravate the difficulty. You know that there's two kind of buts. There's a negative but that throws off everything that you just said, and then there's a positive but. This is a positive but. Amen? It says, but... If he has a firm hold upon God, he will be able to help the disease of distracted mind. He will be able to point his patient to who? Say a lot of saints to whom? Say a lot of saints to whom? To Christ and teach them to carry all their cares and perplexities to the great burden bearer. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, uh, page uh, 444. Now put these two texts in your notes. We won't go there for the sake of time. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12 and 13, the Bible says Asa was diseased at his feet. And he says, but he sought not the Lord, but the physicians. And in verse 13 says, and Asa died. Anytime we go to the physicians and not God specifically, brothers and sisters, we put ourselves in a, in a great bind. I'm not saying that God doesn't use physicians. I'm not saying that we should not go to physicians. But if we understand that 90% of diseases are spiritual, there's nothing that a physician can do for you without Jesus. Amen? Now, three reasons. Now, have you ever noticed that, you know, you tell persons how harmful smoking is and you tell them how, you know, it destroys the lungs, etc., etc., uh, these physical habits of disease and 
you show them cigarette boxes, you show them that you know, smoking is like putting a gun to your head, you do all these things, different tactics and methods to help them to get the point across. You show them the cigarette box that smoking kills and smoking clogs the arteries and causes heart attacks and strokes, etc., etc. You show them that smoking may cause a slow and painful death. Uh, you, you show them the difference between a healthy lung and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a smoker's lungs. And after you do all of this, then guess what you see them doing? They take another cigarette and then they, they begin to smoke. And then this person that you've been trying to help for all these years decide that they're going to give their heart to Jesus. And just like that, they quit. You ever wonder why? You want to know why? Because the work of a true medical missionary is what? Is largely a spiritual work. There's nothing that the devil can do to help. Uh, there's nothing that you can do against the devil in such cases, brothers and sisters. We must hold on to Jesus Christ, who's a great physician, who's a true medical missionary, and when we hold on to Christ, then we get these results. Are you with me, saints? Let me close out. Three reasons. Now, what is the objective of a medical missionary? Max, two questions. Is the objective to add more years to life? Or what about adding more life to years? You know, they say uh, our objective is not just to add years to life, it's to add life to years. You ever heard that before? Is that truly the objective of a medical missionary? It's not. Adding more life to the years is a wonderful blessing and it's a fringe benefit. But the objective of a medical missionary is to add eternal life. We understand that there are some cases that God says, you know what? I'm the one that allowed that disease to come because I see no other way of saving that person. When our medical missionaries come in contact with these persons, their focus is the spirituality. Their focus is where does this person stand spiritually? Where is this person's relationship in light of God? Is there sins in this person's life? And then God can safely lay that person in grave to save. They might not get the five or ten more years. They might not get even the 50 more years as Hezekiah did. But they get something far more lasting. They get eternal life. That's the objective of a medical missionary, brothers and sisters. It is a high calling. A medical missionary don't eat what they want and drink what they want and act how they want and go where they want. A medical missionary finds his firm root and grounded in Jesus Christ, and he only follows the method, the principles, and the things that Jesus would have him do. That's a medical missionary. That's a medical missionary. And rather than just come in this morning and share with you some principles of health and telling you about not eating between meals and telling you about taking your walk and this, that, don't you think that this is something that's more lasting? And now when you get these, so these simple basic tools that I'll share with you next time I'm here, I never want you to lose sight of the objective. Our objective is not to add life to years or years to life. Our objective is to add eternal life. That's a medical missionary. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for these words, dear Lord. And we just pray that these words will be bound upon our minds and our hearts. We pray that we'll never lose sight of this one lesson that we've learned this morning, Father. If there's one thing, one thing that we grasp this morning, is that the work of a true medical missionary is largely a spiritual work, and the work of the gospel and healing should never, ever be separated, dear Father. Christ's method cannot be improved upon, the words of inspiration says. So as we go on in later studies to learn more of the principles of medical missionary work, the practical hands-on things. We never want to lose sight of the objective because uh, we know that every decision should be predicated on the ultimate objective, which is to add eternal life. Eternal life. So we just pray for your help in this area, dear Father. Please be with us and guide us. And we just pray that these words are riveted in our minds, dear Father.